if you look at it strictly from a pharmacokinetic perspective and look at concentration uh, time profiles, uh, a typical drug is uh, a typical dose and dosing regimen is is administered so that you maintain concentrations at steady state within a desired therapeutic range. All right, so this is kind of our hypothetical situation where everything's all hunky dory, and these concentrations at steady state are oftentimes a function of the activity of those enzymes and transporters. So as the activity of those enzymes and transporters change, the concentrations at steady state will change. And so what we've got here in a green curve is a situation where we're inducing, some phytochemical is inducing the activity of those enzymes and transporters. Less drug gets absorbed. What does get absorbed gets eliminated more quickly. The half-lives are shorter. Less drug accumulates, and you may fall below this minimum effective concentration. The drug's not effective. On the other hand, if you have a situation where you're inhibiting those enzymes and transporters, then more drug gets absorbed, half-lives get longer, more drug accumulates, uh, and you may have some toxic manifestations. So again, that's kind of the spectrum of possibilities. So let's look at some examples of those. Far and away, the most problematic botanical with regard to clinically relevant herb-drug interactions is St. John's wort. And I'm sure there's some St. John's wort experts in the room, no doubt. But it's often touted for its antidepressive activity. And it actually has pretty decent antidepressive activity if you have a high-quality St. John's wort product. Um, and we'll get into why that's the case in just a bit. But the bottom line is that um, it has a very high drug interaction risk because it renders most drugs ineffective because it, has a, it, it induces the activity of a lot of these enzymes and transporters. Now, way back in the day, in the late I think 1999, we did this study. And so we were looking at, and, and at the time, we had some funding from the NIH looking at the effects of, of botanicals on, on human drug metabolism. And so we were looking at some of the more popular ones. And one of the first ones we looked at was St. John's wort. And so we're looking at the effects of St. John's wort on this very important enzyme, 3A4. And so the uh, blue circles represent just individual subjects, and the red are the mean values. And this is a, uh, we, we, we studied both young and elderly cohorts. And if you look at the effects of St. John's wort, 30, a 30-day 30 course of St. John's wort on 3A4 activity, we saw about a 100% increase in both situations, which, uh, you know, struck us as, 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 that was quite, you know, quite noteworthy, we thought. But nonetheless, okay, it induced the enzyme. Is that, is that a big deal? Is that clinically relevant? Literally two weeks after we finished this study and before we even started to submit it for publication, I got a call from one of our transplant surgeons uh, at, our, at, uh, at, at UAMS, and he was, in, uh, he was our... Uh, probably one of the best uh, kidney transplant surgeons in the country. And he calls me up and he says, hey, Gurley. He says, I know you work with that herbal crap. And uh, he actually used a more harsher expletive than crap, although the same number of letters. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, do you think St. John's wort could affect cyclosporin? And uh, again, we had just finished that study. And cyclosporin is a substrate not only for 3A4, but it's also a substrate for one of these efflux pumps called P-glycoprotein. And so I said, uh, do you have patients on St. John's Ward and Cyclosporin? He goes, yeah. I go, uh, I bet the levels are really low. And he goes, how'd you know? I said, you need to get them off that as soon as you can. And so, um, so what, this, what this study, what this curve shows, or what this graph shows, is the trough concentrations of Cyclosporin for a 28-year-old white female who was five years post-kidney transplant. And so she would come to the clinic once a month, and have her cyclosporin levels drawn because cyclosporin has a narrow therapeutic range. If the levels get too low, you may, you may reject your transplanted organ. If they get too high, you can damage the kidneys. Right? And so she would come in once a month, and for the longest time, her levels were within our desired range. Around Christmas time of 2000, her levels just started to plummet. And so she went from 100 milligrams a day to 175 milligrams twice a day, which is a pretty significant dose of cyclosporin. Uh, levels just kept going down. She started developing signs of acute rejection. And that's when I got the phone call from Dr. Barone. They had, and the way they had found out about it was she, she had revealed the fact that she was taking St. John's wort to the dietician on the transplant team. And uh, she said, well, yeah, I've been taking this St. John's wort because I was feeling depressed, and do you think that might be what's causing all the angst with all the transplant surgeons? And anyway, long story short, took her off the St. took her off St. John's wort. About a week later, her cyclosporin levels just skyrocketed. We finally got them back under control. Unfortunately, in this case, her, her acute rejection devolved into chronic rejection. She lost her graft. She had to go back on dialysis and back on a transplant list. And this is just one of four cases at our, at our center. This is another one that I wanted to share with you. 
This is a Sankasporin trough concentration from a 38-year-old black female who came to us from Detroit. And when she came to us, her levels were, she was already on 175 milligrams twice a day, which is a whopping dose of Sankasporin. And the levels are just really low. We were just really freaking out about why they were so low. And uh, at, she was like the third, the, the third case in, in, in our series. And again, the dietician said, just for, you wouldn't have to be taking uh, any dietary supplement, would you? And dietary supplement, what do you mean? She, oh, you know, things like ginkgo or garlic or maybe St. John's wort. Oh, yeah, at St. John's wort. I love that stuff. I, that keeps me from going crazy. And so uh, they said, what, would you mind not taking it for a short period of time? Oh, that'd be fine. And so as soon as she, took, as soon as she came off the St. John's wort, her cyclosporin levels jumped up at least into our range where we were a little bit less concerned about her developing rejection. All right, so at about the time that Dr. Barone and I published our case series, uh, there were there articles from all over the world were coming in showing that St. John's wort was affecting cyclosporine concentrations and leading to heart transplant rejection of, of, of uh, heart, rejection in heart transplant recipients, liver transplant recipients, and kidney <laughs> transplant recipients. So clearly, this was an extremely clinically relevant herb drug interaction. Now, the reason for the, the reason that St. John's wort causes so many problems is there's a unique compound in it called hyperferrin and also a variant of that called adhyperferrin. And long story short, what it does is it turns on the genes for the cytochrome P450 enzymes and several of the transporters. And it does that because hyperferrin binds to a protein called an orphan nuclear receptor. And one in particular is called PXR. Sometimes you hear it referred to as, as SXR. But, but when it binds with, with, with uh, PXR, it moves to the, to the cell nucleus and literally acts as, it turns on the genes for these enzymes and transporters. But what's really interesting about hyperferrin is that it's the most potent ligand ever discovered for PXR. Uh, prior to that, we were always worried about rifampin being a noteworthy uh, inducer of cytochrome P450s. But uh, uh, St. John's water, at least hyperferrin, makes uh, rifampin look, look pretty lame. Now, we talked about St. John's wort's ability to affect some of these efflux pumps, you know, these, pump, these uh, proteins that pump drugs out of cells. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of drugs uh, have poor bioavailability is because they just can't get past the intestinal mucosa because of these, trans, these uh, efflux pumps. And one of them in particular is called P-glycoprotein. And there's a, one drug that's a classic substrate for P-glycoprotein, and that's the drug digoxin. Of course, digoxin is used to treat congestive heart failure. And so what we were showing, we've done some studies with uh, both rifampin and St. John's wort looking at the effects, their effects on uh, rifampin. And so the black squares just represent the concentration time profiles for, for um, uh, digoxin uh, before and after rifampin and St. John's wort. And so you can see that in both situations, they reduce the area under the curve almost the same. But what's different is that this effect with rifampin is due to a 600 milligram dose of rifampin a day. The effect with St. John's wort is just 24 milligrams of hyperferrin a day. So it's very potent stuff. So what makes it so problematic? Well, when you affect 3A4 and P-glycoprotein, you're probably affecting about half of all conventional medications. As I mentioned, uh, hyperferrin appears to be at least partially responsible for the antidepressive effects of, of uh, St. John's wort. But for the longest time, St. John's wort was standardized to another phytochemical present in it called hypericin. And the reason for that is, 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 is one, it's, it's, it's unique to St. John's wort, but it's also real easy to measure, whereas hyperferrin is very difficult to measure because it's light sensitive and it's heat sensitive. And it's just kind of a tough thing to do. Uh, but now most St. John's wort products are standardized to hyperferrin. But every now and then you'll still find, but now just because they're standardized to hyperferrin may not always tell you how much hyperferrin is in the product. And so... Uh, many years ago, we started looking at uh, hypericin and hyperferrin content for both, uh, for, in this particular case, six different brands of St. Of St. John's wort. And you can see that they're all standardized, in that case, to hypericin. And the hypericin con contents were, were pretty consistent. But the hyperferrin contents just all over the map. <clears throat> From as little as a milligram per gram to almost 14 milligrams per gram. But what was really interesting to us was one brand with just two different lots of the same brand and you had almost a fourfold difference in hyperferrin. And when you start to get above 10 milligrams per gram of hyperferrin, you really have a significant uh, likelihood for uh, herb drug interactions. Uh, so again, um, it was kind of a, a, kind of a crapshoot in terms of whether or not 
a particular St. John's Wort product was going to, one, be effective, and two, cause a lot of, a lot of issues. So again, to kind of summarize, it induces not only 3A4, but a whole host of other cytochromes, as well as some of these efflux pumps. We saw, we saw how it affects digoxin and cyclosporin. It renders warfarin uh, ineffective, the anticoagulant warfarin. Uh, birth control pills, a lot of miracle babies associated with the use of St. John's wort. Hmm, I wonder how that would come about. Uh, it wasn't just a St. John's wort, but nonetheless. Uh, the, of course, it also, it also affects the statins, uh, a lot of, HI, a lot of um, HIV meds. Uh, certain cancer chemotherapeutic agents can be rendered ineffective. So you can see that the, the numerous consequences, and it renders most medications ineffective. 